I am Barak Sina. I'm the Middle East Fellow here at RUSI. Um, I'm not going to introduce Congressman Wexler and Yossi Kupuwasa because they've been introduced in previous sessions. I will introduce Ambassador Manuel Hassassian, uh, who's the Palestinian ambassador here to the United Kingdom. And I also am very thankful that Ambassador Hassassian is able to make it today. He's overcome a tremendous number of obstacles to be here today. And on also a personal note to both Ambassador Hassassian and Yossi Kupuwasa, um, my greatest thanks to the two of you, because had I not had the two of your support, I would not really be having a conference today. So thank you so much, both of you. Um, the, the titles of the sessions are how could, a Palestinian, how could a functioning Palestinian state be sustainable or workable without Israeli cooperation if Israel would still control borders, airspace, water, gas, tax collecting, etc.? How will Israel react to the UN General Assembly resolution? Please, Yossi Kupuasa, if you can go first. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon again. Uh, how could a functioning Palestinian state be sustainable? Uh, basically, there's no problem with that, because uh, even today, the Palestinian Authority is functioning and uh, is basically sustainable. Uh, Israel controls the security of its own, its own security, everything else. Uh, it's controlled by the Palestinians. And, uh, this is the arrangement that was uh, formed since the signature of the Oslo Agreement. We keep our share of that. And uh, even today, uh, we are trying to minimize our involvement in the Palestinian life. Uh, our intervention is basically twofold. One is taking care of our security, as I said before, and the second is helping the Palestinians to run their own business effectively. And we are trying wherever possible, without uh, compromising our security, to make this happen. And uh, fortunately, since uh, over the recent uh, couple of years, we had uh, relatively uh, calm situation uh, in the areas controlled by the PA. Uh, we have managed to uh, minimize the number of roadblocks. Uh, we have managed to uh, take advantage of the cooperation we have with the security apparatus of the Palestinians uh, and uh, to fight uh, terror uh, basically together. As I said before, it's more Israelis, less Palestinians, but still there is uh, there's some sort of uh, uh, reasonable cooperation with the, with the Palestinians on uh, providing security. The Palestinian forces take care of their own security. And all those things that we do control, if we do so, is because of uh, our security concerns. Of course, this is not the story told by the Palestinians. Their story is about terrible uh, occupation and uh, terrible things that are happening, but we all know that there is prosperity. We all know that uh, the GDP in the Palestinian territories rose by almost 10%, whereas everybody else is uh, suffering economic uh, difficulties. Uh, this is enabled by the situation on the ground and the uh, fact that uh, money is uh, flowing in. Yes, it is true that when there were, uh, when there was a different situation under Arafat, uh, when the Palestinians have decided to uh, uh, embark on a terror campaign that lasted something like five to six years, we had to take all kinds of uh, severe uh, security measures that had uh, a price for the Palestinians living in, uh, in the Palestinian Authority territories. Yes, that was the case. It is much less today. But the Palestinians, of course, are very much in love with their story. And uh, if you look at uh, the way the Palestinians uh, tell the story in, in their, to their own people, the story of the terrible occupation is always there. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, this is, of course, not helpful in uh, moving forward. This is not to say that we want this situation to, to remain like that. Not at all. 
we do want to, to see a change in the situation, and we do want to see a possibility to reach an agreement that would, uh, from the Palestinian point of view, we don't accept it as an, an occupation, but for if the Palestinians call it an occupation, we want them to be in a situation where they can say that there is an end to the occupation. And uh, we want uh, the Palestinians to have a situation where they can be functional and all of that. But the Palestinians don't want it to happen. That's, that's a problem. And uh, I suggest that before we all agree that the situation is unsustainable, and to some extent it is, we'll think about what are the alternatives. Are the alternatives we are putting forward more sustainable than the one prevailing now? And try to find an alternative that is better sustainable. Because the alternative pushed forward by the Palestinians, or I would rather say by certain groups within the Palestinians, because this is not all the Palestinians, certain groups within the Palestinians have taken control of the decision making there and are moving towards a situation that is much less sustainable than the current situation, instead of moving to a situation that would be better sustainable. And uh, the uh, fact is that the people that are more concerned within the Palestinians with the st stability of the situation, with the st st sustainability of the situation, they are uh, quite unhappy with the uh, move that is uh, suggested now. And they themselves call for a second thought about it. And uh, I can quote from uh, an article uh, published by Ziad Asali in the uh, Washington Post uh, on July 22nd, where he warns that the significant gains that Palestinians have made recently in building institutions and preparing for, this, for the state must not be put to a risk. And he says, if the veto on the settlement resolution effectively killed that issue, what would the consequences be of a veto on a statehood resolution? And this is the other Sally, and we all know whom he represents. So uh, we are moving, according to a decision made by the Palestinians, to a less sustainable situation than the one we have today. Not that it's the best situation, but it's more sustainable than the one that we're moving to. And I wonder, why is it that so many groups around the world, so many states, why is it that even the Europeans consider the possibility of supporting this group that, even according to Palestinians, act in an irresponsible way and close their ears to what the responsible Palestinians are saying? Because we have to be clear, if the Palestinians take the UN uh, move, They breach the Oslo Agreement, the fundamental element of the Oslo Agreement, which calls for not changing the legal status unilaterally. And if they then start to refer them to themselves as a state and not as a Palestinian authority, if they escalate the political battle against Israel, if they allow more violence, Israel will have to adopt to this new reality. It's not a matter of taking punitive actions. It's just a matter of adjusting yourself unavoidably to a new situation in which it becomes clear that we have a partner that does not respect agreements, that is not ready to accept us as the nation state of Jewish people, as we discussed that before, that will not be ready to accept less than what it is going to be promised by any kind of uh, decision taken by the international community in the UN. 
and that it insists that we accept a new reality imposed unilaterally by the Palestinians and accept their state with which we don't have any agreement. And you know, the Palestinians come to us and say, please, once we do this act of ours, be magnanimous. Don't, don't do anything that would uh, trouble us. We may try to be magnanimous, but we have to be realistic. This is a new situation. They want us to accept their state with which we don't have any agreements. We have an agreement with the Palestinian Authority. We have an agreement with the PLO. We don't have an agreement with the Palestinian state. And this would mean that we shall have difficulties in implementing those agreements. And this might cause some co concern to the stability of this uh, Palestinian entity, whatever it is. Eventually, after we shall study probably the new situation very thoroughly, because we at that point don't know exactly what to expect, every day it changes, we may have to uh, take measures that will have some negative impact on the sustainability of the Palestinian entity. And uh, the Palestinians, I think, know that. At least those who are concerned with this, with this situation. I always give this small example. Suppose in November there is a group of terrorists contemplating to carry out a terror attack from Nablus. And the Palestinians, because they are Fatah people, decide not to take real measures in order to take care of them. And we know about it. Obviously, we shall have to send uh, an IDF uh, unit to try to arrest these people before they carry out their attack. Now, where is the Palestinian self-declared state going to stand in this context? Is going to let us in? Is going to try to stop us on the borders, so-called borders? What is exactly going to happen on the ground? Nothing is going to change on the ground, I can tell you. For the Palestinians, nothing is going to change on the ground with the exception of more frustration. And there are some other elements that may develop that may cause even greater frustration and more problems and put more questions on the sustainability of this entity. I sincerely hope that somehow in the last minute some people will open up their eyes and say, let's stop it before it's too late. And reasonable Palestinians will convince their colleagues to stop the clock for the benefit of everybody. But uh, I always have in front of my, my eyes this movie, Talma and Louise. It's a wonderful ending. It's a car driving over the cliff. This is a responsible issue. It's a matter of responsibility. It's not a car. It's not a movie. And uh, I really want to believe that somehow, in the last moment, somebody will wake up and stop this from going on the way it is. There are alternatives. Abu Mazen always repeats this question. My first, second, and third choice is negotiations. But I don't want to have negotiations. So my second choice is going to the UN. Give me a third alternative. There are many, many third alternatives that are much more responsible than going to the UN unilaterally. And I hope this alternative will be chosen. Thank you.
My next speaker is Congressman Robert Wexler. The question before us is how could a Palestinian state function without Israeli cooperation? And how will Israel react to the UN General Assembly resolution? I, I feel like a bit of a third wheel. Obviously, an Israeli and a Palestinian are far better poised and capable of answering the question. But from an American perspective, it, it, it seems quite evident. How could a Palestinian state function without Israeli cooperation? It can't. It won't. And that is, in great part, why the overwhelming consensus of opinion, Democrats, Republicans, the administration, Congress, think tanks, uh, the overwhelming consensus of opinion in America is diametrically opposed to the Palestinian effort with respect to the UN resolution. And President Obama will direct uh, our team at the UN to veto anything that comes out of the Security Council because this entire effort is counterproductive. It is harmful to the Palestinians. It's harmful to the Israelis. And yes, it's harmful to America, too. But with all due respect to the Brigadier General, who eloquently lays out the Israeli perspective, um, to simply analyze this as if there isn't a history or there aren't causes and effects misses the point. The, the Brigadier General, who I have nothing but extraordinary respect for, talks about, well, what if after the UN resolution there's a terrorist cell to be found out in Nablus? What, what will the IDF do? Well, there isn't an American that has anything to do with any part of this conflict that doesn't completely appreciate the security needs of the State of Israel from the President on down to the most junior member of Congress uh, and thankfully, an overwhelming number of the American body politic essentially agree with the Israeli security positions. But that's not the whole equation. This isn't a, a conflict about security arrangements. This is a conflict about ultimately territory and all that comes with it. And what should be what should have been the Israeli response to all of the events that have unfolded, say, in the last two and a half years? The Israeli prime minister should have accepted the position if he supports a two-state solution, which he professes to do, and I certainly respect the prime minister's profession, then there's only one way in which a two-state solution will be realized, and that is negotiated between the Israelis and the Palestinians based on the 1967 lines with agreed territorial swaps. And if the Prime Minister of Israel is unable to take the position that a two-state solution requires 1967 lines with territorial swaps, then don't be surprised that the Palestinians are frustrated. President Abbas is frustrated with the Israelis. He may even be more frustrated with the Americans. He's frustrated. Now that doesn't, in my humble opinion, justify what is about to happen at the, Pal at, at the UN because it's going to harm the Palestinians. And there was a discussion earlier regarding the congressional reaction. I can assure you the congressional reaction will be hyper to say the least. American financial support for Palestinians will become a political football that most will be happy to kick around and come out on the side of cut it off. It's popular to cut off foreign aid anyway in economic times that we're in, and cutting it off to the Palestinian Authority, you won't hear a peep in your district when you go home. You'll get cheers. 
And the fact of the matter is, with the unification agreement, there actually isn't even any discretion. American law is clear. Dr. Lerman talked about it earlier. If Hamas does, in fact, play a role in the Palestinian government, everyone's hands are tied. American law dictates that America will have nothing to do with that government. So what could or should be done? For us, we are somewhat baffled, quite frankly, that both our friends on the Israeli side and the Palestinian side seem to be taking actions that would appear actually to be counterproductive to their own interests. To my Israeli friends, I would respectfully ask, does the world look so bright today for you? Your relationship with Turkey has disintegrated. You've got a time bomb in Egypt. Your southern border is porous. The Sinai is chaotic. You have one friend left in the world, for all intents and purposes, the United States of America, and we become more and more isolated on this issue. We have an opportunity collectively in Syria, maybe the best opportunity we've had in a very long time, to deliver a significant blow to Hezbollah and to Iran in terms of removing Bashar Assad from power. America and Turkey are working hand in hand in that regard. That's the good news. And I would ask my Israeli friends, do you really think Prime Minister Erdogan, and I'm not casting or I'm not laying blame one way or the other, but if Prime Minister Netanyahu six weeks ago had responded to President Obama's May speeches and said, I may not agree with everything President Obama said, however, I do accept his premise that a two-state solution requires that we negotiate based on 1967 lines with agreed territorial swaps. Do you think Prime Minister Erdogan would have the maneuverability room to do what he's doing today? Now some, and maybe my dear friend Dr. Lerman would argue, he intended to do this for a long time, and I'm naive. I don't think so. He may have intended to do it all along, but when the Israeli Prime Minister casts himself, rightfully or wrongfully, as opposed to the 1967 lines with land swaps, you then give the opportunity, provide the opportunity for those that may be your opponents to take liberties. And with respect to my Palestinian friends, you may be frustrated with the United States. Everyone should understand America does not deliver Israel. We don't get born and then go into this role of today we wake up and we're going to deliver Israel. That's not how we view our relationship with Israel. It's a partnership based on respect, common interests, common values and the like. We don't deliver Israel. And Israel makes its own security decisions. And we are an alliance and an ally the two of us that will not be broken, whether this personality or that personality may have a difficult moment or not. But if the Palestinians think that they will have an American administration that is more committed to a two-state solution and respecting the Palestinian position more than President Obama and this president and this administration, good luck. Good luck. Last point, back to my Israeli friends. I guess the question that baffles me is simply a question of leverage. Not whether settlements are good or settlements are bad, although people on the Israeli side that I respect enormously, extraordinary advocates, but they, on the settlement issue, seem to argue both sides of the issue. On the one hand, Prime Minister Netanyahu has argued in Washington he says, this building that we're doing, it's really not all that contentious because, in fact, we're building in cities or towns or communities that everybody knows when there's a two-state solution will be within the internationally recognized borders of the state of Israel. Okay, that's not an unfair statement. 
except if the man making it refuses to provide a map, refuses to provide to an American president his vision of what his own state will look like. And on the other hand, we sit back and we say, well, the, the, our Israeli friends are a group of smart people. They're not suicidal. So maybe they know something we don't know, and I will stop with this. In analyzing leverage, if I were an Israeli, I would calculate to myself, well, do I think my nation, in five years, eight years, 10 years, will have greater leverage to resolve my conflict with the Palestinians in a way that's most favorable to me. And if I concluded that five years from now, eight years from now, 10 years from now, I in fact will have greater leverage, then I would agree entirely with what Prime Minister Netanyahu is doing. Delay, delay, delay. But if you conclude, as most Americans conclude, that Israel's leverage, whether you calculate it from a qualitative military advantage, from an economic position, from a moral position, from America's stature, which doesn't seem to be getting greater, and America's ability to influence events, if you calculate all of these factors, most people in Washington say Israel's leverage to end this conflict today on terms that are most beneficial to Israel is as great as it is likely to be for an extended period of time. So delay is contrary to your interests. And that's what I would respectfully ask my Israeli friends, that if you agree that your leverage today is greater, then simply say 1967 lines with agreed territorial swaps and I know often Israelis think the entire world is destined to be against them, but no, it's not. Yes, there are some classic anti-Semites, but there's actually a great number of people, yes, in the United States and even still here in Europe, that will actually see the merit of the Israeli position. And that's what Israel ought to do. They should have just agreed to the Palestinian motion if the UN Israel should have come up with its own language. There were a few Israelis who suggested it. What an out-of-the-box move if Israel, in fact, came up with the motion. Write it yourself. Here's how it ought to be. And you know what the last line should be? When you're done with this, let's go to the negotiation table. And that, I would argue, would put Israel in an entirely different position, much more favorable. Thank you. I would like to start first <clears throat> by apologizing for not being this morning. And if anything that uh, is redundant with my statements, I do apologize for that because I was not here. I know Congressman uh, Wexler. I have been uh, in many sessions with him and uh, I think he represents at least a balanced view of the American position. Regardless, we beg to differ on certain issues that uh, we cannot see the United States dramatically transform its policies and understandably so because as Israel continues to be a domestic issue for the U.S., we cannot see a divorce in this Catholic marriage between Israel and the United States, although this present administration is trying its best to start with the two-state solution, but unfortunately for the last two years, what we have seen is hollow promises, and this is not the intention of my discussion here, as much as I would convey to you the Palestinian perspective. And to come back to our friend Kapil Wasser, he, he reminds me of a 20 years of polemical discourse that proved nothing except futile ideological orientations that did not budge even one inch to understand the political realities and the pragmatism that the Palestinians have sold for the last 20 years in changing their political attitude and behaviors. And still, now we're talking about Oslo. My friend, what is left of Oslo to breach? Oslo is dead since the year 2000. And we had to deal with new political realities after the Oslo agreement. 
And is this something new which is terrifying today, Israel, the declaration of statehood? We have declared, my friend, our statehood since 1988. Why is it today this counter strategy of the Israeli public propaganda, the Hasbara, is trying basically to show the world that this is counterproductive and this and that? What is this? Why are you terrified from our declaration of statehood? This is our right. It's our right for self-determination. And I will come back to, the, to, to, to this later. If nothing is to change on the ground, why is this campaign? Why people are so horrified that this catastrophe is going to change new, uh, the, the new ground realities? As if there is a hurricane, I don't know what to call it, Irene or something else, that if we go to the United Nations, the day after is going to be detrimental, where convulsive violence is the name of the game. Who said so? Are we threatening the state of Israel by going to the United Nations? Anyway, I was disappointed to see a session on Israeli security needs and not to have a single Palestinian to talk about his security needs. So this is an imbalance. Unfortunately, uh, whether there were speakers or not, but we could have, you know, salvaged that position. Sorry, there was a session entitled, what are the Palestinian security concerns? Yeah. That was the opening session. Okay. Now, the simple answer to the stalemate of the peace process is something that I always reiterate in my speeches, is the fact that we, both Israelis and Palestinians, unfortunately are stuck between the historically inevitable and today the politically impossible. We had embarked on a peace process that had been futile and lacked any substantive value and seriousness, not to mention political will. 20 years of hundreds of rounds of negotiations, meetings, amounted nothing except to convulsive violence, wars, and destruction. And under the banner of peace, we have witnessed dramatic transformations of our society that had been dislocated, uprooted, and continue to suffer the daily vestiges of modern day occupation. We could not achieve peace because we felt this meant to change the mindsets that are overwhelmed with the obsession of security and the psychological burden of mutual distrust and fear. Our conflict today transcends, unfortunately, the issue of territorial concessions. It is no more the issue of territorial concessions and it transforms this conflict into a protracted one where the essence revolves around the struggle for existence and survival. Whether to accept the other or not, that is the question. However, we should not also underestimate the religious factor in this conflict that gave it new directions and thus molded it into a more complex structure to be resolved. Peace cannot achieve, and everyone knows this, with non-parity, power politics, and the matrix of control and subjugation. Peace can only be achieved if it is just fair and serious. In the absence of any meaningful peace process, we the Palestinians have taken hold of the agenda and are demanding admission to the UN and bilateral recognition from other countries around the world. We are asking simply for what the international community has agreed. We are entitled for many years, but which, which for just as long they have been completely ineffective in actually delivering the goods at the end of the day. Despite threats from Israel to annul Oslo, from the US Congress to withhold funds, despite warnings of unspecified dangers, the Palestinian strategy has remained front and center. We believe that admission to the UN is the best and most effective guarantor of a return to direct negotiations. Going to the UN is not in lieu of direct negotiations. This we have been reiterating time and again in the press that going to the United Nations is not aborting the negotiations over a two-state solution. I just came from Palestine yesterday and believe me, I drove through the roads to look at it, to see whether still we can salvage the two-state solution. I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it is all over. There is no sense even to talk about two-state solution. We believe the right of Palestinian self-determination is not subject to Israeli censor. 
Israel cannot censor our right to self-determination or approval, nor is it dependent on negotiations. In fact, UN endorsement of a Palestinian state will reinforce international law and salvage prospects for peace based on a two-state solution. The ending of 44 years of occupation and the implementation of international law do not qualify as compromises by Israel in any one's language. On the contrary, it would usher in a new beginning in which Israel and Palestinian could cooperate as two independent states. That's our perception of a two-state solution. It is a historic tragedy that after 20 years since the signing of the Oslo Accords, Israelis continue to colonize more Palestinian land, grab land, exploit fully Palestinian resources. And then under the banners of peace and Oslo, we still talk about a two-state solution. Recognition of a Palestinian state, I believe, will strengthen the prospects of reaching a just and lasting peace. In effect, recognizing a Palestinian state on the borders of 1967 would constitute the first recognition of the Green Line, the demarcation line in the 1949 Armistice Agreement as Israel's defined eastern border. In other words, Israel would become a normal country with internationally recognized borders only when a Palestinian state is established. So going to the UN for membership as a full-fledged state is to bring back the Palestinian question to the agenda of the international community and to bolster the concept of a two-state solution. Palestinians in the occupied territory and in the diaspora will extend its total support through nonviolent means and peaceful demonstration as it is ongoing today in Berlin and Nalin. But to answer the two questions put to us by the, by the conference, how will Israel react to the UN uh, resolution and whether uh, the Palestinian state would be sustainable or workable without Israeli cooperation? Both questions are questions for Israel to answer. Will it continue the occupation of a sovereign state? Israel is occupying another state. Naturally, the Palestinian has a right to self-determination under customary international law and Article 51 of the UN Charter. We are unarmed and our armed capabilities do not suffice to exercise our right. Therefore, we have the legal options to take the matter to the Security Council and World Courts call for sanctions against Israel through or outside the realm of the UN, or call for an international humanitarian intervention through or outside the realm of the UN, or call for a collective self-defense through or outside the realm of the UN. Which option we shall take depends on the circumstances and the political realities. Okay. I didn't answer the questions. Okay. Just, Just give me two minutes. Okay. How will Israel react to the UN General Assembly resolution? We've heard it, so I'm not going to even deal with it. In real terms, Israel's control over borders, airspace, water, gas, taxes will remain a practical hindrance to the realization of an independent and autonomous Palestinian state. The issue before us is the issue of separating a just peace from an imposed one. A sovereign Palestinian state from a Bantustan one has to do not only with territory, but with control. One indisputable fact that has accompanied the entire peace process is that Israel will simply not relinquish control voluntarily over the West Bank and East Jerusalem, and it will not relinquish the core of its settlement policy or control of the West Bank aquifers or the areas, economic areas or its security arrangements extended over the entire Palestinian area. The Palestinians would have to cede to the elements essential to their self-determination economic viability and developmental potential, territorial contiguity, true independence, a normal civil society, recognized border under their own control. This is the only way that Israel's long-standing and ongoing campaign of creating facts on the ground can be effectively neutralized. It will not affect our independence and self-sufficiency. There are some possible measures that we could think of, replacing the shekels with, the, with, with US dollars, and it has been you know, reiterated time again uh, through Central Committee members of Fatah. And despite uh, trade ties with Israel, moving to dollars will still be a step towards economic sovereignty and a symbolic, of course, political advantage for the Palestinians. We request the General Assembly an advisor opinion on the bid for statehood from the ICJ, 
This would increase and reinforce the momentum towards statehood. Palestinian fora and institutions have sustained and developed under Israeli occupations, and they have continued to represent the will of the Palestinian people. However, international law and regulations have systemat systematically issued rulings against the separation barrier, settlement expansion, and the occupation of Israel over Palestinian territory. With further international support and recognition of the plight of Palestine together, Israel's meddling with internal affairs of it will be monitored and dissuaded. And let me just finish by saying, the aim here, I hope today, is not to place blame and continue the finger pointing, but it is necessary to confront the truth in order to act collectively to overcome the impediments to achieving a peaceful solution. Thank you.